evil out there, isn't there? It's just evil. And, um, and I'm sure people are mourning. The population of that uh, town, I heard, is about 12,000. So it's just really, really sad, huh? Uh, amen. Uh, good to be here with the men. Uh, today, we're going to open up 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll afterwards have a little bit of discussion together, people around you. But, you know, the whole point tonight is a lesson is to really talk about why it's so important for us to be in God's word as men. Uh, but to be, but to be actually using God's word. So it's not just being in God's word, but actually practically be using it in our lives. We need that. Second uh, Timothy chapter three. We're going to move around a little bit, um, but Second Timothy chapter three. Keep in mind that as we read this here, it's a private letter between the Apostle Paul to Timothy. And so uh, I've always enjoyed reading uh, Timothy because it's a, you get an insight into this relationship. Uh, very often in New Testament, uh, letters are written to whole churches. This is written from one individual to another in a very intimate relationship. But here you have Paul give direction to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll pick up in verse 14. Keep in mind there's a lot of things that Timothy's uh, dealing with. He's leading a church in Ephesus. And there's a lot, a lot of issues within the fellowship. But here you have Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, it reads, But as for you, continue on what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know, uh, you, because you know those from whom you've learned it, and how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through, the faith, through your faith in Christ Jesus. In all scriptures, God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We all have heard, most of us have heard this passage, but again, uh, who is Timothy? Isn't he a strong Christian? Yes. He's a very strong Christian. He was handpicked by Paul in Acts 16 to go on a missionary journey, and we know Paul takes his time picking people, in some cases, unpicking people. <laughs> so Timothy uh, was a strong disciple, but he's now in leading, he's leading a church in Ephesus, and they're facing so many issues, so many challenges. But here you have Timothy receiving special, uh, specific instructions on how to address pretty much everything. And he reminds him about being in God's Word, doesn't he? And sometimes it's amazing how we can overcomplicate our faith when it really is going back to the basics, isn't it? It is Paul who also would say in the previous letter, 1 Timothy 4.16, Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Like, wow. So here he's trying to remind them, be in God's word. Uh, at one point in 1 Timothy, he tells uh, Timothy in chapter 4, he says, look, Timothy, avoid godless myths and old wives' tales. Avoid it, meaning that perhaps he was getting involved in it or something. You know, like, Timothy, stop doing all that. Let me tell you what's the most important. The most important is to remind you about being in God's word. And he tells them, remember, that these, are, these holy scriptures, they actually make you wise for salvation. How awesome is that? But not just that, he reminds them in verse 16, which we just read, God's word is God breathed. Remember, it comes from God. It's the essence of God. It comes from Him and is useful. And what are the four ways it's useful, he tells them? In teaching, in rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Think teaching. What comes to mind you think of teaching the way he's referring to it, by the way? Any thoughts? Teaching. Rebuking. What comes to mind you think of rebuking? That's a pretty strong correction. And correct in training in righteousness. And even says, which is pretty powerful, it will thoroughly equip you for every good work. It, hang on. God's word will thoroughly equip me. Thoroughly. For every good work. And isn't, what is he doing there? Isn't he doing God's work? Timothy, what you need is what you have is the Holy Scriptures. It will equip you for everything. And wow. And the answers are in God's Word. 
But what's some other good works? How about how to have relationships with each other? How about marriage? That takes work, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, but it's not part of God. Doesn't it's God's design? God's plan is, you know, mar- ma- okay, but that's good work. So, what can thoroughly equip us for the good work of marriage? God's word. It's right there. How about parenting? The answer is God's word. He's having to remind Timothy. Everything you need, Timothy, to be to be thoroughly equipped is in God's word. It's the proper tools. Everything you need. But it's almost like, um, you know, I, I think of it almost like, not just for the moment, but for the future. What lies ahead, what you're going to face in the future, all the answers are in God's word. All the tools you need, the proper tools are there for you. They're in God's word. God's word is meant to really fully equip us. So, you know, man, I, I think, you know, all the more, I, I, I need to spend time in God's word, don't I? You need to spend time in God's word, don't you? Because, you know, it's going to thoroughly equip me. Not only will it make me wise for salvation, but it will equip me. You know, I, I think, I don't know about you, but sometimes you can go, I, I want to read God's word, and I'm, I'm searching for a feeling. Like, I just want to feel something. Something. What? What? Who are we doing? Yeah, but I'll be honest, sometimes... I don't feel anything. That's not what he's saying here, by the way. He's not saying, get in God's words so you can feel the gooey. He's saying, get in God's words so you can be thoroughly equipped. That's very different. I don't know if I want to feel the ooey gooey, whatever that is, opposed to how to have a good marriage. That's what I want. <laughs> the ooey gooey or how to parent. That's, you know what? But he's, he's reminding Timothy, it's practical. Use it. It thoroughly equips. Thoroughly equips. It's your toolbox. It's your own personal toolbox. I appreciate Habakkuk. You know, you go, Habakkuk is a, is a book that we can over, overlook, but it's fitting today, isn't it? It's fitting today. and The ending is an awesome part, you know. And How many, by the way, know the ending of Habakkuk? Where it says, there's no sheep in the, you know, like... Yeah, you've gone to that because you needed that. Sometimes you go to Job, when? When you're feeling down, you're like, I need some encouragement. (laughs) You don't go to Job for a pick-me-up. You go, oh, at least I'm not him, you know. But you kind of, the Bible thoroughly equips you for everything. It's everything. So how familiar should should you get with it? Very familiar. Because you're going to miss out. I'm going to miss out. So yeah, we got to spend time, but it, why? Because it thoroughly equips us. You know, I, I love how Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Like your word gives me light for my path. And um, every time now we get, get in the car, if you have to go somewhere, what do most people do now? What do you use? GPS. But how many remember back in my day? The ADC map. Anybody remember that? Right? I remember like, I, don't, I remember at one time I couldn't afford one. I was like, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> open the 7-Eleven, come to the right, open it up, and you're like, where am I? Where am I? Page 33! Uh! Some of us bought the, 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 I'm sure there was a Greater Hampton Roads one or the Greater something. What? We need the map. And God, everything you need is right here. Everything you need is right here. So Timothy, you're going through a lot of issues, a lot of problems, it's internal, external. Spend time in God's word. It will thoroughly equip you. Go to Deuteronomy 17 with me. Deuteronomy 17. I actually love this, uh, this, uh, this section quite a bit, actually. We're going to read in a section here that uh, God gives instructions to, to kings before there, even, there wasn't even any kings. Uh, God thought about uh, everything 
And so this little section reading right here is directions just to Kings. And I'm hoping at some point we could begin a, a series just on, on men's midweek on the book of Kings. But I'll uh, we'll read a little bit today. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm, in I'm, I'm in front of a lot of Kings, right? You guys are all Kings? You know what I mean. You're like, I'm a king. You, know, you don't say that at home, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or maybe you do. I'm the king of my castle. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Amen. And then, and then, next time I say, what you say? I'm the king of my castle. But here, here's a section that we're going to read. It's the only instructions given to kings. That's it. So the, re the section we're going to read, every king in the book of Kings or Chronicles, you should think in comparison to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 14, so when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Now be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses, who must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to go get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you're not to go back that way again. He must, not take many, he, must, he must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and of gold. And when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the Levitical priests. And it is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn for the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. This is the only direction you have. And so all the kings on day one, what should they have done? Read, read this, right? A lot of instructions are given here. Oh, well, not, maybe not that many. It's very clear. Don't, don't take too many wives. How many messed up? You know, don't accumulate too much wealth, too many horses. Total trust and faith in your God. That would have been the king's call. But then in verse 18, the king is told, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll the copy of the law taken from that Levitical priest. What is God telling the king to do now? Write down, which would have been what? Yeah, which would have been, what, what books are those? Yes, the first five, the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So day one, he has to write down. And it says, I like it, it says, for himself. Why is that? Because I'm sure he's king. He would have been like, okay, all of you guys start writing for me. No! Day one, he has to write for himself. I've thought about doing this. I'm not sure. I'll do it at some point in time. Thinking about writing the first five books of the Bible. Can you imagine writing that down and going, some of us go like this. Oh, it hurts. Can you imagine writing things down? The entire, how long will that take? A long time. And the language here is almost as if the Levitical priests are over him, making sure he's writing it down correctly. God does not give him, here's some battle plans. Here's a dummy's guide to how to make treaties. Simply, day one, you write down the copy of the law. That's step one. Then after that, what, what do you got to do? <laughs> Read it. Every, the king is commanded, in our language, to have a daily quiet time. Now, I can't think of a Bible verse that says you have to have a daily quiet time. But if you think you're a king, I mean, if you're a king, <laughs> have a quiet time. There's no instruction for the wives, by the way. Obviously, those other passages that talk about in Deuteronomy, uh, it says uh, chapter 8, which they all would have heard, man does not live on bread alone. But here is it specifically given to the king. You know, God wants his king to be fully immersed in his word and all the days of his life. And then the blessing is he will learn how to revere me. And it says he'll have a long reign. 
Just trust my word. You're going to be fine. So how important is God's word in our life? Very important. Very important. To be in God's word is a blessing. But not to be in God's word, wow, it's not so good. We'll look at one bad example. 1 Kings chapter 12. We have more free will than we realize, you know? Let it be that we're, we're, we're men that who are in God's word. We'll look at a man, uh, a king named King Jeroboam. Jeroboam is like, he's the standard of excellence. No. <laughs> he's a standard of, of like evil. <laughs> like every time they're like, like Jeroboam, like Jeroboam, like Jeroboam. So he's a standard of evil. He's mentioned quite a bit. You kind of go, what was it about this man? And by the way, it's, it's a one of the beautiful things about reading, I love reading the Old Testament because it's almost like uh, I'm the youngest of three. Anyone have older siblings? Yeah. If you're smart enough, you realize I have an older brother named Rene. Oh, you've got a brother named Rene too, huh? Okay. Oh, you did. I have a cousin. Okay. I'm sure we all. Okay. <laughs> I had an old brother named Rene, and if I was smart enough, I'd be like, yeah, he's getting a beating for that one. Let me not do that. Or he's rewarded for something. Let me do that. And so if you get a chance to look in the Bible, man, God's upset or God's blessing. Let me learn from that. So here we're going to look at what not to do. Again, this king would have been, would, should have, day one should have done what? Written, written on the law. We'll pick up in verse 25. A uh, little background is uh, King Solomon, or the first king was who? King Saul. Second king was David, and then it was Solomon. And then Solomon, why did he fall? Because of wives that were not fellow Israelites, and he lost his faith. But then the kingdom splits. So now here's Israel, there's north and south. The south is Rehoboam, that's uh, Solomon's uh, son, and the top is Jeroboam. Funny, it worked out, similar name, the top. We want to look at what Jeroboam does in 1 Kings 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now lightly revert to the house of David. If these people go up and offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one in Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. And Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing the calves he had made. And at Bethel he had also installed priests at the high places that he had made. On the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. And so he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. You know, prior to this, one of the prophets appoints him as king, so he is a king from God. God has chosen him, and day one he should have gone into God's word. You know what's interesting? It's not, again, I've said this before, but it's not like we're unable to think without God's word. No, we can actually think quite well. That's the dangerous part. It's not like we lose our reasoning. We have some kind of fleshly reasoning. But here you have Jeroboam, and yet the promise when you read from the prophet to him was like epic. I'm a, God's going to bless you, but here right away he messes up. And why does he mess up? Because he's facing a situation that he's insecure about. Here you have, he's on the north and south. On the south is Rehoboam, and he thought, 
by the way. Verse 26, it says, Jeroboam thought to himself, very often in the Bible, that's not positive. And he thought to himself, he's not a good thing. So I'll encourage you when you have a good idea, just go, hmm, is it a good idea? Because we never have bad ideas if you think about it. He, he thinks to himself, you know what? What's going to happen? People are going to People want to go down and worship him and forget, putting aside what God had just said to him. And then verse 28, it says, after seeking advice. Should we seek advice? Sure. But what was the advice given to him? Build two golden calves. By the way, where could he have learned what should he not done? Exodus! Like, it didn't work out with one calf. All he had to do was just read it. It's like right there. That's all he had to do. He could have just read about that. And then thought, hang on, even getting advice. Uh, yeah, you're giving me some advice that's pretty off here, man. He could have read it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He could have read it. Yes, he may have thought, well, there's no kings in there. True, but what principles can I apply? What principles can I apply? How about in my insecurities, how about read Genesis? How about trusting God despite difficult times? You could have done that. Or Exodus, how God is always faithful, just trusting God. I think, but he doesn't. He trusts himself. And it's sad because his actions affect everybody else's. And all of us here, our actions affect other people. And if you're married, you affect your wife more than you realize it. If you have kids, you affect your kids more than you realize it. And that's a dangerous, that's a beautiful thing, but it can be very dangerous. If we're not in God's word, we can make unwise decisions that have long-lasting Effect. You know, it is interesting because he also, I mean, other scriptures he's violating, he's also doing, he's appointing priests from anywhere. But what did God say about that? Let to be specific. Then it's, it's scary because then he, he, he kind of reasons with the people. He goes, hey guys, Jerusalem, that's just too far for you. And he sets up his own worship place. Just come up right here. That's almost like in the Old Testament, like their own discipleship. For us, it would be like, yeah, Jesus called, but do you, just don't do too much. Just do this. But didn't Jesus, didn't we say Jesus is Lord? Right? Everybody online, isn't it Jesus is Lord? Like all of us. Man, what, what's guiding us? And here he's affecting people because he's not in God's word. And it's, uh, it's sad, isn't it? And really at the end he makes, he, water, he creates really his own religion, a watered down religion. Don't worship too, uh, don't be too uncomfortable in your worship. Here's some priests. By the way, he even makes a festival. Then he, God directed that. And he makes a festival. One commentary read that he makes a festival like before God's festival. It's almost like, wow, we already worship. No! Again, in the absence of being in God's word, as kings, we have to be careful because we will affect tribes, we will affect families, we will affect a nation. We need to be in God's word. It's God's word that gives us direction and shows us where to go. So going back to 2 Timothy. And I can't help but think also, like, uh, there's also so many passages about being in God's word. Uh, in Luke, it talks about, in other gospels as well, being a wise or foolish builder. Yeah. And, and all the, all the, all determine will, will we face challenges if we'll face them without shaking, if we're in God's word or not. I actually had more notes, but I, I think I didn't print, I didn't know where they're at. Anyway. Well, going back to 2 Timothy, you know, the question is, how, how do we live in God's word practically? 
As it says, all scripture in verse 16 is God breathed useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. So we're using God's word. Um, oh, also, when it talks about, in, in Ephesians 5, it talks about our marriages. What should be the center of our marriages? That we're washing with God's word. And in our marriages, that we're talking about God's word. Uh, how about uh, Ephesians how about Ephesians uh, for the for the um, for the fathers? How should we talk to our kids? It says here, chapter six: Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. My point is God's word. It's important in our marriages and it's important in our parenting. By the way, there's no instruction that says, "And help your kids get a good job." And help your kids get a good education. So we understand that's important. Okay, no one's saying don't. Like, you got, it's life. But the instructions are that as fathers, we're the ones supposed to be talking about God's word. It thoroughly equips us for every good work. You know, um, in our interactions with each other, you know, how, how can we live out 2 Timothy, where it says that God's word should be used in our teaching, in our rebuking? and our correcting and training in righteousness. How, do, how can we live that out? You know, I, by the way, it, it does mean that, hopefully, I'm on the receiving part of being taught. Hopefully, I'm on the receiving part of being corrected. And I've had my share of being rebuked. So that means, on one part, let it be that when we interact with each other, that we allow people to use God's word in our lives. That we know we need people to help us, to teach us, that we're humble, that we have a humble disposition. We need people to help correct us. Um, a lot of you guys know that Federico, uh, not only is his birthday, but he's a bodybuilder. <laughs> it's his birthday. So he was born uh, somewhere in the mountains of Bolivia. How many years ago? So many years ago. 45. Taking punches today. Uh, yeah, duct tape. Thank you. Why do you have duct tape in your car? Okay. <laughs> Come on, Elliot. I remember we're, 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 we're working out. I, I don't really work out like that, but, but Chris, next to him, that's Chris with the red shirt. He's actually a, a trainer, and so El, uh, Federico was working out and doing something incorrectly. He, he, he was. I, I do things incorrectly all the time. But Chris comes over and kind of corrects him on the spot. And I appreciate Federico going, all right, like that. Even though Federico does his own workout things, right? He's on social media. I don't really keep up with social media like that. Okay? But I thought there, there's something about being, am I that humble? Am I that humble that someone can help me with God's word? And I'm like, yep. No, I got this. No, but I, am I that humble? And if you're a disciple... The name disciple means student. And we're that humble with each other that we're approachable. Who can teach us or correct us? Or if we need it, please. It's like, is it probably a life saving rebuke? Come on, it's a life saving rebuke. Like, I, I need it. But, but, but Paul's reminding Timothy what we use is God's word. We use God's word on the receiving it, but also on the giving it. You know, um, what, what, what Jeroboam should have received when he got counsel is right counsel. <laughs> but he's given wrong counsel. And I think all the more for us as we interact with each other that we turn each other to, to where as we give counsel? God's word. I mean, how often is it said in the Bible, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Even Jesus, it is written, it is written. He is the word of God. It's like, but he still says it is written, it is written. It is written that we use that with each other. In our homes with our beautiful wives or our family, we can trust our own wisdom or go back to the Bible says. The Bible says. I appreciate the passage. I wasn't even connected with, uh, uh, with this. Eugene was saying, the Bible says, you know, do not, you know, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse 24, it says, uh, oh my goodness, Throw another towards loving good deeds. 
We did not give up meeting together. Some of the habit of doing. And if you haven't met for a while, it's beyond a habit. It is what it is. And I, I'm going to tell you, even in our family, to go, honey, we, we got to be in fellowship. The scripture says so. Now, my idea is, you know, again, we're with our kids. Interact. We go back to God's word. That's the ultimate authority. But you didn't go back to the king. It was a king as a, how would the king lead is by being humble to God's word, learning to revere God's word, being in God's word. And I think for all of us, the best example we can provide our family is that we're submitting to God's word ourselves. So my encouragement to all of us is to be men in God's word. Men that we're using God's word in our everyday life. That we use God's word in our homes. We use God's word when we make decisions. That we allow people to help us with God's word. Uh, and I think all the more as men, as we, uh, amen, I, I, my wife is a strong woman, amen, but that I'm leading my wife with God's word and we're leading the women with God's word. And we're always bringing up God's word. Amen. Uh, at this point we'll break up and discuss. Thank you. Thank you.